Okay, welcome to Micro Lecture 13.1. Um, the title of this Micro Lecture is Orphan Trains, or I Know What's Good For You. It's actually broadly about more things than the orphan trains. It's really going to address the whole kind of child saving movement um, and some of the associate things that were going on and has the impact of the criminal justice system. So, to uh, jump in here, in the 1800s, um, as I discussed briefly, um, there was a social movement, lots of social movements, that really were seeking to improve America. Um, some of these, many of these had very lawful and positive goals. Uh, you had the women's rights movement, also called the suffrage movement, uh, which predates really the, uh, actually you could trace it all the way back if you wanted uh, to the 1700s. Um, Abigail Adams' letter to her husband in the 1770s, who was John Adams, later President of the United States, you know, reminded him not to forget the women in um, establishing this new free country. Of course, um, ending slavery was a movement, a social movement in the United States. Um, civic improvement uh, was another movement in the United States to abolish the kind of machine politics that was seen. Um, uh, eugenics movement was really to improve the genetic health of the citizens of the United States. Prohibition was another movement that really saw um, the use of alcohol as one of the fundamental bad things in society and needed to be changed. And this will culminate in 1919 with the banning of alcohol prohibition in the United States. And then finally, the one we're talking about, the child savers, who used the criminal justice system quite a bit to try to end what they called child abuse and delinquency. Now, um, these social movements had good intent. As I said, the child savers wanted to remove children and teens from the adult criminal justice system. But like a lot of these, and we're going to look at the child saver movement in a little detail here, there was some dark sides uh, to these social movements. Some of the abolitionists, for example, uh, the ones that fought to end slavery, were not, or they did not believe in the equality of men. Many of them felt that blacks were inferior. Uh, they did want them freed, but they wanted them removed from American society, uh, usually by some sort of forcible colonization scheme. Um, some prohibitionists, the people that wanted to really remove alcohol, uh, saw this as a Protestant issue uh, because it could be used against Catholics. Catholic power, political power, tended to be centered in places like saloons for the Irish, or Berchtesgardens, gardens, beer gardens for the Germans, German Catholics, or cafes for the uh, Southern European Catholics. Eugenic reformers uh, wanted to sterilize those who they deemed had poor genetic health. And very often, uh, this equated to poor blacks, uh, poor period. Uh, now, the child saver, uh, savers movement exhibited some clear biases. Uh, like most Americans, they tended to believe that there was an innate superiority in rural life, um, that farm life was going to make people better. Uh, you know, this goes all the way back, if you want, you can read Thomas Jefferson, and he talks about the yeoman farmer and, and how great that is as a, as a model, of course, coming from a man who, you know, ran a large plantation and probably didn't do any real farming most of his life. Um, they were often evangelical Protestants, uh, deeply suspicious of Catholics and Jews. Uh, also, there was a, a racial characterization that was going on in the child saving movement as, as blacks being seen as lazy and capable of aspiring to higher morality. Uh, I'll recommend that you look at the Black Child Savers, Racial Democracy and Juvenile Justice by uh, Goff uh, K. War, who is a um, University of Chicago scholar. It's a good book. Often these groups really sought to impose uh, white middle class values on everybody else. Uh, and were rather intolerant of um, anybody that was a little different than them. Uh, now, one of the things, and I'll, uh, this is only a five-minute lecture, so I can't go deeply into this, is that there was a real split here about using children as labor. Remember, these orphan trains would round up these urban children and take them out to farms and give them to farmers, basically, which was free labor. Um, 
the movement itself was pretty split about when and where children could work. Now, farm labor was seen as a very positive, and we're going to see that still reflected in American law today. Industrial labor was criticized, but never openly confronted. So I'm going to end the lecture with this picture of these two boys that are in a coal mine. Now, you notice they can stand up. The only reason they can stand up in the coal mine is the coal mine is only about four foot. And really, until the 1930s, it was very common in the United States that this child labor uh, was used in industrial situations where it was cheaper and better for the business owners to use. So coal mines were notorious, also cotton mills in the South. Now, vestiges of this is retained in the United States. Under current U.S. law, children age 12 uh, can work unlimited hours on a farm, if it's a family farm, and are allowed to do hazardous work at age 16. Uh, one of the last statistics I found was half the, all the children that died in the United States in industrial or work-related accidents died in farms. Um, that was 237. And one of, uh, one of the things here, I think there's also a, a bias going on against uh, young immigrants. So very few questions are being asked about the deployment of child labor in places like uh, immigrants working in farms or in fields. Okay, uh, on that note, that's just a really quick overview of this and uh, kind of the wet your whistle and get you maybe a little interested in some of these things and we'll move on to the next micro lecture.